I like being introduced as a cynic with a title like this. I think it, um, it's a nice balance for me. Um, the plastic bag. A thing of progress. Introduced in the 1970s, plastic bags were disposable. They were seen as better than the paper bags that they replaced. They're cheaper, stronger, they use less material, and fewer trees are cut down to make plastic bags than paper bags. They're environmentally friendly. So much so that in 2001, we used a trillion of them worldwide. But we know the disposable plastic bag is not really disposable, and yet we all use them every day just like these, and I'm sure we've all used a few of these today, the plastic water bottle. In 2011, Americans drank 34.4 billion litres of bottled water. Recession-busting industry, if ever there was one, that was 4% more than in 2010. Plastic is safer than glass. It's lighter, uses less carbon to transport it. They're better. But are they? Really, we, we solved the problem of convenient drinking water but we made a massive new problem of waste, and yet we use them every day. I can hear some of them squeaking in the audience. The incandescent light bulb. We replaced it with something better. The energy-saving light bulb. It uses less energy, it lasts longer. But while we threw the old ones out, these ones have to be recycled to avoid mercury pollution. And recycling uses a lot of energy, and many people just chuck them out. Is this better? Well... It's complicated, but the plastic bag, the plastic bottle, and the, and the energy-saving light bulb are all common examples of how design and technology can take a problem and solve it and give us more problems in the process, all in the name of progress. We assume that design and technology make things better. We take for granted that's what they do, but what do we mean by better? Longer-lasting, cheaper, more sustainable, higher-tech... Better for whom and who's better ultimately shapes our common future. We keep on doing the same things over and over again. And often we call such behavior this, insanity. Um, this is a well-used quote. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Einstein said a lot of clever things. He also said this. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. And I think that as a designer... And as a community of designers, we need to and we must do more than just solve the problems that other people bring to us. We need to challenge those problems and ask different, more relevant questions. Because as was said before, engineering is about solving problems. But design, I think, does something different. Design is about possibility. It's about life as it could be. Design projects into our future. And I think as designers, we need to get back to the idea that design can shape the future. And so, we're to, to the future that I look now, and I want to talk about how we might use design to ask better questions instead of solving the wrong problems. Can we take design upstream, where future technologies are being engineered and shaped to actually help seek out better questions? And by that, I mean embedding design in unfamiliar places. And actually, in so doing affect the direction that technology takes before we even get to problem solving and actually use de design to help alter and shape the future. So I'm going to talk a bit today about a field that I've been experimenting with this in um, and talk about some of the projects that are hinting at designing different ways of thinking and share some of the collaborations that I think hint at new ways of working with design and art um, embedded within technology. So I started out in architecture and urbanism, but for the last six years I've been thinking about this, something very different. This is a plate of agar jelly, a big square petri dish covered in bacteria that have been engineered by undergraduate students so that the bacteria go dark when they're exposed to light, like a photographic film. And like all good biological design projects, it has a name called E. coloroid. Uh, they all have to have a good name. And this is one of the first sort of physical outputs of synthetic biology back in 2004. Synthetic biology is an engineering discipline, but the aim is to engineer biology, to make biology standardised, repeatable, predictable, and transform it into a material to make stuff that's useful for us. Now, biology has a very different view on the world, if you could even say that. It lives, it dies, it reproduces, it, it does lots of annoying things to which, for the engineers, um, who are trying to make it operate within this neat sort of logic of 
digital and computing zeros and ones. And that's the challenge for synthetic biologists. But its supporters, the, of, the supporters of synthetic biology, believe that it can solve our problems. It, they talk about making the world better, that we'll have new materials, fuels, medicines, and energy sources, and food that made out of biology or made by biology, which biology already does do some of these things, as we know. But this is slightly different, I think. Biology and life with it is being transformed into a 21st century material for design. So as an emerging field, there's actually very little precedent for what design means. At the moment, it's about engineering design. But I think it's a really valuable space to test out ideas as the field is being shaped. Because at the moment, it's about this, problem solving. Yeast is being engineered to make jet fuel or bacteria to secrete rubber for tires or plastics. The same kinds of materials that we already have. What is promising to be disruptive is actually at the same time promising to disrupt nothing. And I think that's disingenuous. But I wouldn't want to say that in public. Um, so instead of just solving this problem, how do we make yeast make jet fuel, which is a big technical problem for the scientists, we need to question how do we use less fuel? How do we invent alternatives to fuel? How do we invent alternatives that don't use fuel or don't need synthetic biology? And I think that's what we need to ask when it comes to what is better. How, instead of just making technology to solve our problems, we need to ask why we're making it and what we want from it. And that, perhaps, is where ethical innovation lies. So I'll explain, I'll introduce some of the projects that sort of bring this thinking, and um, then hopefully we'll, it'll start to make a bit more sense. So this is the iGEM competition in 2004, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, which um, you'll find out more about very soon, but just keep in mind that by 2010 it was this big, and now it's divided into regional competitions around the world with, I think, something like 14,000 alumni have passed through in the last 10 years. So I'll show a film that explains one project now. ECROMI is an experimental collaboration between designers and scientists working in synthetic biology. In 2009, seven Cambridge University undergraduates spent the summer learning the tools of synthetic biology, which is essentially a new approach to genetic engineering. Using standardised sequences of DNA in a format that's called BioBricks, they learnt to engineer bacteria. They designed their own BioBricks using genes copied from existing organisms, inserted them into E. coli, and created bacteria that secrete colours visible to the naked eye. Ikromai went on to win the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition at MIT in 2009. And joining us now is one of the winners of the iGEM competition. Welcome to Science Friday, Ms. Mullen. Hi, thank you so much. Well, I am part of the Cambridge 2009 iGEM team, and our project was called Ikromai. And what we were trying to do is to improve bacterial biosensors. They're bacteria um, that can tell you the concentration of a pollutant in water. And they can do this because inside them they have a detector. So we developed um, two different parts, the sensitivity tuner. And this actually tells the detector when to turn on and when to turn off. So you have control over um, what level of the pollutant you're detecting. And how does the bacteria show that it's on or off? We use something called a color generator, which means that our bacteria changed color when the detector got switched on. Wow, so they light up in a different color. They actually change color. It's oh. visible to the naked yeah. eye. So let's say if you put a swab of the bacteria in the, a polluted river, the bacteria would just change color. Yep, exactly. So you'd probably want to put a sample of your water on a bacterial plate, maybe not the other <laughs> way around. <laughs> well, how would you envision something like this being used other ways in the future? As designers, we worked with the team to explore Ekromai's potential as they were developing it in the lab. And together, we imagined a timeline proposing ways that living colour could evolve over the next century. These scenarios, some of which are shown in this film, explore the different agendas that could shape Ekromai's use and in turn our everyday lives. One of the first real applications for this technology may arrive quite soon. A cheap disposable biosensor for testing groundwater contaminated by arsenic. Bacteria could also be used to produce natural colorings and dyes. By 2015, there may be a profession of people who hunt for new pigments in the genes responsible, bringing them back for use in the food and textile industry. By 2039, you can go to the supermarket and buy the simple probiotic yogurt for cheap personalized disease monitoring. The yogurt drink contains E. chromi bacteria, which establish a colony in your gut. They monitor for chemical signals that indicate the presence of a wide range of diseases. 
they detect a disease, they start generating the corresponding coloured pigment, producing an easily visible output to prompt you to seek your doctor. 2049 sees the rise of the Orange Liberation Front, a terrorist organisation from the Netherlands, who are angry because a biotech company in China has patented the gene for the colour orange. In 2069, Google releases pollution mapping bacteria into the atmosphere that turn red in the presence of excess CO2. As the saying goes, red sky in the morning, Google health warning. Our collaboration meant that eChromi was a technology that's designed from the start at both the genetic and the human scale, and with a long-term outlook. We found that design and science could have a meaningful exchange in the lab, which could prove useful when developing technologies in the future. There is stuff up there. Um, so this was a very small collaboration that has really set a precedent for a lot of stuff within synthetic biology, which I'll talk about more. But I want to focus on one bit, because it's the bit that everyone always wants to hear about. Um, I got caught in Copenhagen uh, security at, um, in the airport last month carrying one of these back. Um, medical models, I said. But um, we actually made this for, to take to iGEM back in 2009. And the idea was we wanted to confront the scientists and engineers inventing this technology with a visualization of what we thought it could be. So as designers, we wanted to challenge this representation of biology as this, machines, biology and life. Are, you know, This is the prevailing way that synthetic biology is described. And we instead wanted to say it's biological and actually emphasize that. And to us designers, the gut, you know, leaving aside the ethical debate, this is a really interesting interface for um, a biological computer. And if this isn't what we want, then what do we want from this future? What I discovered along the way is by even thinking about the future, in, even in a critical way, you accidentally might make it more likely. And that is something that I, I'm trying to resolve in, like, in the other work that I'm sort of working at the moment is by even creating this space, you do actually influence the scientists who are trying to make this happen. And that wasn't necessarily the, you know, the expectation of this work, whether it was too successful that we actually shaped and guided the future and made science take on board that message about biology, I don't know. But either way, what was really important for the students was trying to bring implications and applications together into the design process, which was um, kind of a fresh way of thinking about iGEM. Because ultimately, synthetic biology... Its impact may be scientific, it may be economic, it's certainly political, geopolitical, but it's ethical and it's ecological and it's personal. This, it is going to change the relationships that exist between nature and culture, between biology and design, between creator and product. So this is the tree of life and um, there's kingdoms of bacteria, archaea, eukarya, we're down here on the left somewhere. Um, how do we place these designed things that we're going to make into the complexity of the living world? How do we classify organisms that may have genes from all over the different kingdoms and whose ultimate function is a human-intended one? Well, we need a new branch of the tree of life. This is something I began to think about, and so I added one to see how it looked. And this is the synthetic kingdom, just a quick engineering solution to an engineering problem of classification. It's now on the cover of the first textbook of synthetic biology, and it's been on the journal cover. And it's, what's been really interesting about it is it's been a really useful fiction. Um, it's enabled me to have con conversations with scientists who are willing to suspend their disbelief to actually talk about this issue. Um, I was on the phone with a scientist who's a Nobel laureate uh, who wanted to put it on the cover of his journal. He said, well, maybe you could just delete some of these details because they're wrong. I'm like, this is all wrong. Anyway, but whether, <laughs> I mean, that is the role of fiction. Um, whether it is in the wrong place or the labels are wrong has enabled conversations with scientists. I was at a Tree of Life conference where they all started scribbling on postcards that I gave them. Maybe it's smaller leaves, maybe it's much smaller because we're never going to make so much stuff. Or this is Durendi at Stanford. He's like, it's like a tabletop that covers everything. <laughs> He's my collaborator. Um, or it's more like a spaghetti network. Whichever one it is, it's a useful tool to help us think about how these things we're designing out of biology are different or not so different at all. And whether I've given synthetic biology a kingdom of its own and kind of validated it. Or does it actually put synthetic biolog biological designs back into nature and removing this distinction that we artificially create between our things and ourselves? and actually kind of highlighting that connection between nature and what we design. Would that enable us to design better than we do today? So it's been a really interesting, again, a light-touch provocation that's actually had a lot of impact. 
And I'm going to talk about a small recent project as well um, that I was inspired by last year. Um, NASA putting out a job advert for a synthetic biologist to design food, synthetic biological organisms to feed astronauts on the way to Mars. I said, it's so unfair. That's an amazing job. Um, and I can't apply because I don't know any science. Um, <laughs> Um, so I got in touch, and I was like, you know, maybe you need a designer, or probably a chef, not a designer, but I, I propose a designer, um, to think about this problem of how you need 30,000 kilos of food to sustain a, a Mars mission there and back, and um, this is a real problem that um, NASA needs to deal with. And at the moment, what's going on is this. Um, that's not very exciting. Uh, so to enable mission success, you need happy astronauts. And they're probably not astronauts who eat algae or tofu for a thousand days um, because that would only feed your kind of nutritional needs, not your emotional and physical and, I mean, like, psychological desires. And I actually sat in on a space food conference with NASA who were talking about this mission su success aspect and uh, there was someone who actually said, please, can we not just talk about um, yeast and algae for the next two days, because that's just the engineering solution. We need to think about other stuff, but then that is what they talked about. Um, so we, working with Andrew Stellatano and Sasha Poflep, who's a long-term collaborator, came up with this project called Seasons of the Void, where we imagined delicious space fruits that are grown using redesigned yeast, um, actually based on real research where they're trying to replace photosynthesis um, with electrosynthesis so that organisms can get their energy directly from electricity. So these organisms that we imagine based on real research are gorging on electricity and they grow in the void of space as the ship flies away in a slingshot to Mars um, and a, a kind of a totally different way of farming emerges where things are grown in vats and gravity shapes these kind of fruit and the way that the, um, the ship actually ends up sort of being eclipsed by different planets or uh, sort of solar flares affect the energy supply that power the batteries, that power the fruit essentially, means that farming is actually remains a kind of a hands-on activity for these astronauts who are off to the ends of the galaxy in effect in terms of our cultural imagination of Mars missions. And for me what was really interesting about this in terms of genetic engineering is that Advanced technologies designed for space often come back to Earth. Uh, we have cordless vacuum cleaners, baby formula, memory foam mattresses, these things that you know, are part of our everyday lives but are not very remarkable, but were all designed by NASA or other space agencies. And would we begin to accept genetic engineered food if it actually had this gloss of space travel? If engineering functionality and human desires can be balanced, would we actually adopt this as a way forward? The GM food debate may never have been further away and as close at the same time. So I'll finish by talking about how these kinds of collaborations can actually end up in the lab. This is Synthetic Aesthetics, which is a bigger project that was funded out of a sandpit as well, actually, by the EPSRC and the NSF in the US. And it was actually bringing these questions into the science. We brought six synthetic biologists and six artists and designers together into six collaborations. They spent two weeks in a lab and two weeks in the studio, which is unusual. And we asked them to look at these questions. Can you design nature? How do you design nature? And how could you design nature well? They clashed their ways of working. It was a kind of night logistical nightmare following this lot around the world. But I was very lucky I got to go and, and see what happened. And I'll talk about three of the projects. So we paired Fernand Federici, who's a plant scientist, with um, David Benjamin, an architect. And you'd think there was little in common between what they're doing, but actually there was real overlap in terms of the, um, the tools they use. David uses g genetic algorithms. Fernand builds 3D models. And they started looking at artichoke cells, um, the xylem cells, and how these cells actually solve these incredibly complex spatial problems. And could they actually harness that? So they analysed the data with a computer scientist and actually extracted like a biological programme which they could then apply to other structures. And in effect, changing this definition of a biological computer, which in synthetic biology is something that's powered by DNA as code, instead they were saying, could it be the whole cell itself is actually a computer that we could extract natural logic um, and actually apply it to solve problems? And it opens up a whole different way of working that 
um, is very exciting, I think, for both architecture and plant science. We paired a designer from IDEO, in fact, two designers from IDEO, with, plant, with um, cell biologists from UCSF. And they were interested in like, applying design thinking strategies to the science. And two things that are really interesting came out of this one. The similarities between the processes of thinking in science and design. Design, we are used to a messy process, but science talks about this straight story that we did this and we did this, and then we published the paper. But actually, is that damaging and, and mess, that hiding that messy process, which really goes on what scientists might call night science, could we actually um, find out more and learn more and innovate better by accepting that? The designers ended up designing fictions because they realized that engineerable biology wasn't here yet. This is a cup that um, they imagined could grow, uh, containing nutrients you'd drink from. But for me, this is the really interesting part. What is this future going to be like when corporations are um, actually you know, working with biology? Could, something like some, could a practice like IDEO help define what good design practice might mean? Or could we see things like MIT's Media Lab emerging with collaboration between design and biology? And I'll finish by talking about this project, The Inside Out Body, um, by Christina Agapakis and smell artist Cecil Tolas. They wanted to challenge this cultural fear we have of biology. And they see there's this conflict between the antibacterial culture we live in and this promised future powered by bacteria. We're covered in bacteria inside and out, and um, we rely on them to exist. Increasingly, that's being understood. And they're in cheese, too. Um, Limburger cheese, if anyone smelt it, smells like feet, because it's the same bacteria. Could you use body bacteria to make cheese? Yes, this is how cheese is made. There's definitely stuff that gets in there. So they decided to go the whole way and collect samples from the human microbiome and make human cheese. And um, as I said, I was very lucky. I got to visit all the residencies, but this was a case of being in the right place at the wrong time, Daisy's armpit. People think it's gross. Maybe it is. I don't think it is. I think context is everything, whether the bacteria in your body or in the things we design. We can't isolate synthetic biology from the wider world and from ecosystems and behaviors. This hints to a future where it's not we are what we eat, but it's what we, we eat what we are. And biology that's being planned to be engineered is closer than circuit diagrams and machine diagrams can, can ever show. This is a symbiosis that we're planning. We've written a book about this. It's coming out from MIT Press and in the spring. And what's so important about this project is it's funded by science, I think, that it's not by arts. And <laughs> it's scientists coming to art and design saying, where do we go from here? Bringing these implications into the engineering design process. So I'll finish by just summing up. I think that... I've tried to share how we need to, I think, we need to think about the problems we're trying to, to solve as designers. And by involving design in our earlier, we can open up new areas of thinking, but also find ways to ask better questions and have so better problems to solve. And um, I finished just with this is what I'm trying to think about at the moment. Instead of perpetuating the present, how do we use design in many ways to help shape our future? Thank you. Thank you.